So if you actually go watch the documentary, my side profile view, and if you turn the brightness up on your screen, you can tell that it's my face. And there was a Twitter thread where they went through the roster pictures of all the girls on the team, and somebody was like, I am no scientist, but 100% it's this girl. All right, everyone. Welcome back to the Loopcast, where we talk faith, culture, and politics from a Catholic perspective. We are becoming the swimming podcast. We have our second swimmer on the program. Her name is Paula Scanlon. You might recognize her silhouette. It was on the What is a Woman documentary. She has now decided to come out public and has taken the time to sit down and talk with me today. Paula, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Of course. So what really, the moment where we knew, okay, we got to get her on the Loopcast was we saw your interview with Matt Walsh when you came out publicly. It was excellent. But one thing that you dropped there was that you were Catholic. Not only Catholic, you said devout Catholic. And so as soon as I saw that, that piqued my interest. I think we were talking a little bit earlier. Did you mean to even let that slip or was that something you intentionally came in saying, yes, I'm going to tell that? Yeah. So definitely not something I had planned. Again, I know that even in a What is a Woman documentary, Matt didn't even bring in the fact that he's Catholic. Um, so I know I know Matt is Catholic, obviously. And so I never really intended to bring it in, but it just came over me. It came up and Matt really did change his entire facial expression when that did happen. I think you guys obviously couldn't really tell from the, the video, but I know that, that definitely meant a lot to Matt for me to bring that up. Um, and that was kind of like the turning point of the interview in my mind where I was like, OK, like, I know I'm doing the right thing. And this, I just had like a power kind of come over me. So I'm really glad that it did come up. And again, it was not planned. Yeah. And I mean, it's kind of hard to miss with Matt. He has that huge PX right here in that's his really- forearm. But um, that's one thing that I really admired about that interview was, yes, you said you were Catholic, but you also brought up a lot of science. You brought up a lot of logic. That didn't seem to be a, a fallback answer for you. It was a part of it, of course, but you really were logical. And also for people who don't know, you got your engineering degree in computer science from Penn of all places. So I think I really admired how intelligent your answers were, but also that you weren't afraid to talk about your faith. Uh, has that always been something you've kind of focused on is trying to give science-based answers, but also not shying away from your faith? Yeah. So my dad actually worked in physics, um, so he like quit his corporate job or like when he kind of sort of retired, and then he started working on physics. So just throughout my life, we've always as a family worked on the balance between science and our faith. And so obviously there is a huge conversation going on of, you know, if you're if you're a Christian, you're anti-science. And again, in Genesis, there's a lot of supernatural stuff when people bring up, oh, well, this is contradictory to evolution or whatever it might be. Um, But my entire life, without even realizing, I've just worked on balancing scientific fact and scientific study, but also with my faith. And I don't think I even really realized that until a lot later on. I didn't think about it actively throughout college, but it just turns out that because I came from a Catholic background and also a scientific background, I just kind of found a way to blend those two things together and just really formulate my ideas without leaning on one too hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'd like to get back to the beginning of your story if we could. So I also noticed your entire family went to Penn. Your brother did, your parents did. uh, And so you were obviously an excellent swimmer. Was that always in your mind? Like, okay, Penn's the place. I'm going to go where my family went. Was that a goal of yours as a young kid? Not so much a goal. It was more that I had a high performing academic family. So I needed to go to a school that was within the caliber of my parents' pedigree and background. But for me, my brother was always a lot smarter. Um, So I'm dyslexic. So I really struggled in school at the beginning. And I wasn't even sure if going to a top school was going to be a possibility when I was a kid. Um, So that's kind of where swimming came in. It was really like the rock that I had. And so my brother went off to college when I was in sixth grade. And that's really when I started swimming a lot and focusing on doing that. And that's when I started to realize that maybe I could do it at a division one level or in college in some way shape or form but definitely as I got older and I realized I had you know good enough grades it was definitely going to be a possibility that I could go to the same school my parents went to and my brother yeah so that almost just adds even to the picture that I've been researching up on you was overcoming obstacles working extremely hard to be able to not only swim but swim at a division one level while pursuing an engineering degree. I, I mean, my brother's an engineer. He told me how hard everything was. I completely believe him. So when you were swimming, uh, how did that interact with your course load? And why did you keep up on that discipline knowing, you know, okay, there's not much of a future for 
female swimmers. Why did you choose that hard path? Yeah, I think the reason you have something like swimming in any sport is it keeps you grounded, right? So I actually took some time off from the swim team um, in sophomore year, and my grades actually didn't even get that much better. And I thought that taking a little bit of time away from that because I was just really too busy was going to help, but it didn't end up being beneficial. It was, it was, you need the balance to do something else. And I think swimming in a way is a blessing that you get to have an opportunity to step away from your work. And for me, I'm solving really hard math problems and, you know, other engineering things. And when you just take a step away from your desk, from your computer to get that answer and swimming is that opportunity to have like a two hour break for you to stop thinking about it. And then when you come back, you're then able to solve that problem in a way you wouldn't have if you just sat there the full two hours. Yeah, and the, the word you use there, grounded, uh, really comes to play here because so you you got an announcement from a member of the men's swimming team, and of course I'm referring here to Leah Thomas, and knowing that swimming was kind of this rock for you, this this grounding, was that really hard to reconcile, something that kind of defied your logic and a lot of people's logic that and can you just take me how the announcement went? When did How did that all happen? So, yeah, this announcement was in the fall of 2019. So I was actually a sophomore. Um, and again, this didn't end up happening until my senior year. And we were just told that we had a team meeting and the men's team went first. And again, I don't know precisely what happened in that meeting, but I asked a member of the men's team and he told me that uh, Will Thomas at the time announced that they would be leaving the, the men's team. And then the men went. Then they got, you know, went to the locker room and then the women had a team meeting. And this was very strange because we've never had it. We've never ever had separate team meetings. We're a combined program. So we do everything that we do with the men's team. Um, so a separation of the team's meeting was so unusual. And we go and do this. And, you know, our coach is there. His name is Mike. And he just says, this is this is Will's meeting. And then, you know, we're just told. I'm transgender and I'm going to be transitioning to the women's team. Um, I've already been on hormones for a few months now. And that was it. There was no whatever. And it was a very, very brief meeting. And at that point, you know, like everyone was kind of confused or in shock or, oh, wow, okay. Um, so there wasn't really anything else said about that ever again, actually. We never even had another formal team meeting about it. Interesting. So what was the initial, you said there was shock, obviously, but when you were talking to other girls on the team, what were your personal conversations like? Yeah, well, I think I lived with one of the captains and I think they were just were asking, you know, oh, how are we going to make this person comfortable? And again, I'm a loving and accepting person. So I said, oh, of course, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do everything I can to help this individual feel comfortable. But I still in my heart knew that maybe it wasn't the right thing, but I never really knew how to express that to my teammates at the time. So I would just only really talk to people outside of the team. I remember like the day after the day we found out I had dinner with some of my friends who were swimmers and that was all I was talking about. And they were like, well, it's a year away at least like, well, I don't care. And everyone like just had to listen to me talk about it because I just was, didn't know how to handle it. What what specifically bothered you about it? You said didn't know how to handle it. Like to you, even if you didn't know how to express it at the time after some reflection, what bothered you? Was it the, the invading women's spaces? Was it the competition element of it? The unfairness? I think it was, so for me, right, pre-transition, you don't know how fast or slow someone's going to be once they've gone on these experimental hormones. There's no scientific study to say, say you're going to slow down 10% or whatever it might be. So just knowing how fast Will Thomas as a male swimmer was and comparing those times to women's times in my head, I just said, wow, like Will would be a faster than the fastest Olympian on the women's side. And again, I didn't know what hormone therapy does or how much of it it would be taking, anything like that. But just looking at the raw numbers, that's where I said, okay, like we could potentially have a Olympic champion on our women's team if the times are exactly the same. Right. And I think those are pretty reasonable observations. I know other people on your team, you, you said in that interview with Matt, uh, we're having similar. And so I think the the reaction was you had one teammate that went to administration kind of upset saying, hey, this isn't right. I'm going to go do something about this. And then came out of that meeting, completely different tune, scary different tune. I, you didn't totally extrapolate on why you thought there was the change. Do you think that there was a threat level there? Why do you think that change was so dramatic and happened right away? I think it was not just 
the conversation that she had with the athletic department. I think it might have been related to also her parents just basically saying, you know, there's nothing you can do about this. So if there's something you can do, you might as well just be supportive. And I do understand that, right? If, if there's something I can do in a situation, I might as well just go on the side of being kind and caring and supporting something. So I don't blame anyone who was put in that situation at all. Um, but that would be my read of it. And again, I'm not her. I'm not, I was not there. I never even went to the athletic department one-on-one -on -one myself. But just definitely a lot of, you know, people feeling helpless. And once you feel helpless, you just kind of turn to the other side. Yeah, and a lot of people... I mean, the rest is history, right? And we had a long interview with Riley who competed at the same building. And um, of course, it became this big national story. And I'm really curious because you went on What is a Woman? Of course, it was this cultural shocking documentary. How did they reach out to you? So how did you get in touch to even go on the documentary? What was that like? So there is actually, okay, so this is backtracking. I was a member of College Republicans, and I'm not. This is actually my first time publicly admitting that, so everyone will know now. <laughs> Exclusive. Um, and there was a member of College Republicans that kind of had not been very active that was a writer for Daily Wire, coincidentally, who went to Penn same year as me. And as soon as I started breaking, I had messaged one of the girls who was, like, president of the club, and I said, does anyone have his contact? I just want to talk to him about this. I just want to see if Daily Wire is doing stuff. I know that they had been a big leader in just talking about transgenderism as an issue, things like that. So I reached out and we got in contact and he immediately had a million requests for me. He was like, you can come on the Candace Owen show next week in the middle of my season. And I was like, okay, I can't do that. And I was like, I don't think I can be public, but I'm happy to give you some quotes. Like, I just wanted to help. And then he just said, hey... Matt Walsh, if you know who that is, has a super secret project he wants you to be a part of. And I said, okay, I'm not sure what that is. I thought he was writing a book. He did end up writing a book. So I'm sitting in class and I get an email from Matt Walsh himself. Like I'm literally just sitting in class. And Matt Walsh emails me and is like, hey, this is my producer. We're actually making a movie. Can you be part of it? We can fly you out anytime. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh my gosh, what? And they're like, you can be anonymous. You can be in it yourself. And I actually did really want to be in it, like, full, like, real face. But my parents said, again, we thought the documentary was going to come out while I was still a student because it was originally supposed to come out in May. And I just didn't know the exact date and I thought it might be too risky. So I said, okay, I'm just going to go for the anonymous, but we can do it. So I couldn't fly out until after my season was over. And that happened to be spring break. So I had finished my swimming season, like, literally five days before when I flew out to do it in like a day and then I came back and it was it was a really crazy experience and it was just so strange how that all worked out that I happened to want to get in contact with this guy he happened to know that Matt was up to something secretive um and yeah so it was definitely just a crazy experience <laughs> yeah and nothing happens by accident so I know with with documentaries sometimes uh, the, the edit people receive can be different than their experience of going in were you satisfied with your final edit? Did you do a lot more recording that didn't make it in? Yeah. So I actually got interviewed for about 30 to 40 minutes, I want to say. Um, and I think it was just to give them the optionality of what they wanted to put in. Again, the actual thing is only about a minute. So a lot definitely did not go in. But again, I don't think more should have gone in because the scrambled voice is not the most pleasant thing to be listening to. Um, and I think they did pick like a good part like obviously there's things i said that might have been a little bit more controversial but i think they really focused on the us being silenced thing which has been one of my biggest problems with this entire situation is how the university silenced all of us and how they really made us fearful for voicing our our opinion and voicing the truth yeah and one thing i always wondered too so you went in obviously the silhouette scrambled voice were there any attempts to dox you or figure out who that was and it got back to you yes so if you actually go watch the documentary, my side profile view, and if you turn the brightness up on your screen, you can tell that it's my face, even if you don't know me. And there was a Twitter thread where they went through the roster pictures of all the girls on the team, and somebody was like, I am no scientist, but 100% it's this girl. Um, and also, this was something that was really interesting to me, is for my side profile, apparently it's very obvious that I'm Asian. So I'm, again, my mother is a Taiwanese immigrant. So I'm half Asian and you can tell that I'm Asian. And so there was a bunch of people saying like saying, oh, Leah, you know, go kill your Asian teammate or 
your Asian teammate doesn't like you. So there's a lot of like anti-Asian stuff coming into it. And prior to any of this, I didn't think my side profile looked that Asian. Um, so that was definitely something I found very interesting that they were really like using this as a race issue, which I don't think is fair. Um, no. But yeah, so that was something I found online also, which was a little bit hurtful too. Wow, absolutely. And, and I think it further goes to the fear. Like you said, your parents were concerned. Was it... So was it a concern for your safety? Was it a concern for your future employment? Was it a concern with your your scholarship? What was that threat for you to, if you would have gone on publicly, what do you think could have happened? Uh, definitely the job is the primary one. Um, so again, right out of college, you go with your first job. You need to just make sure you do everything by the books. And especially for my mother, um, being an immigrant, being part of the Asian community, it's very important for your kids to not just go to a good school, but to have a good job to make sure, you know, the education that my parents and my parents did pay, I wasn't on scholarship or anything, the education that they paid so much money for is being put to good use. So it was definitely that. And also just in general, future employers, you don't know who is going to be reading you and what their political opinions might be about it. And I don't think that this is a controversial issue. I think speaking about this should be known as this is a woman's rights issue. Um, but people don't always see it that way. And you just have to be afraid of, you know, who might view something the wrong way. Yeah. And so you, you obviously, I'm talking to you right now, you came out public, of course. Was there a final straw moment for you that you said, enough, I, I have to come public. I need to support people like Riley Gaines. Or was it a combination of a lot of small things? So I knew I wanted to at some point. The exact timing of it, that was not necessarily planned. So it started when, after Riley was attacked, I was like, okay, now they're violent. This is really scary. Um, But it really started just thinking about it when I couldn't sleep at night, thinking about all the young women and girls. Um, And I would, I would take a lot of this to prayer. I would, you know, like, you know, I do my nightly prayer. I would just say, you know, God, like, please... Help, help me cope with this, whether it, you know, help me stop thinking about this so much or help me come to a, a solution that, you know, is just. Um, and eventually I just kept on saying, you know, like, God, please like lead me in the right way. And it did eventually come to I needed to talk about it publicly, but I didn't know what that was going to look like. So I did actually just kind of, you know, think about do I want to do something on my own? Do I want to try to go with a big media company? Um, and I did reach out to my contact at Daily Wire, this kid who, um, who went to Penn and I just said, like, I'm thinking about this, like, what would you guys be open to? And they obviously said they wanted to do a sit down interview with Matt. They also helped me film a personal statement, which I'm not sure if you've seen, it's all on their YouTube and, and such. So that was something I wrote myself because I wanted to have an opportunity to write something myself that just wasn't being interviewed. Um, and everything seemed agreeable. But weirdly enough, I didn't know what they had planned for the one year anniversary of What is a Woman. So the timing of when I really like came out with it, I texted I texted the guy at the beginning of May. It was really like in the exact timeline of when they were doing this anniversary stuff. And I, I didn't I didn't know about any of it. So again, like the timing worked out really, really well. And also this week is the um, anniversary of passing Title IX. So I get to help be a part of all that stuff. So like the beginning of May, June was the perfect time to come out with this. Yeah, that's so awesome. And well, I have a couple of questions here, but I would like to start here. You keep mentioning, you keep mentioning Catholic. Of course, I'm Catholic. This is a Catholic program. One of the most frustrating elements of this entire thing is when people who aren't Catholic, when people who aren't Christian, accuse you of being not Christ-like for not being welcoming to people different than you, yada, yada, yada. What is your answer to people that say, hey, what you're doing right now is not Christ-like. You're not acting Christian. Yeah. And that's something that was so challenging at the beginning, right? I said, you know, I took a lot of this to prayer saying, you know, God, am I wrong for feeling this way? And I really did feel wrong. I felt, you know, I can't feel hate. And I think the part that coming to the Christ-like is who my anger or my dis- like like of the situation is aimed at and i think individuals that are angry at transgender people for existing or i'm angry that leah took my spot or i'm angry that this happened at that individual 
that I understand how that could come off as unchristlike. And for me, that's not where my anger is or any of my, you know, any of my feelings. And I think that's something as Catholics we need to work towards, right? Understanding that obviously a feeling of anger is not a feeling we want to have and a feeling that God wants us to have either. But if you do have that feeling of anger, digging deeper and wondering where that's aimed at. So that's where I, I say that I'm not angry at Leah and I want that to be very clear and I've made that clear on every instance and I've never suggested that we should, you know, eradicate transgender individuals. I think they're people that deeply struggle with something, right? To think that your body is wrong. The idea that your body is wrong is is really harmful and a really hard situation to be in. And I understand why someone might be in that position. But it doesn't mean that, you know, altering your body and doing all taking all these hormones you're not supposed to take is right. So that's definitely something to work on. Also, I know that it's very easy as a as a person to be upset, but as a Catholic, you need to understand that the anger towards those people is not what we're trying to push. And I think if more people saw it that way, that we really like we do love them. We can just be upset with the the situation and the people that allowed uh, an unjust situation to occur. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a little bit of a long answer, but that is like something I'm working on too. That's a, that's, a, that's such a beautiful reflection because that actually is a very Catholic way of looking at the situation. Of course, like the individual itself, they need love. Um, and I think that's, that gets lost, I think with a lot of the, especially online discourse about it, because it's so easy to shoot off tweets that, you don't have the right context, don't have the right nuance, and maybe can come across the wrong way. But I think you identified correctly that there is something unjust. The concept of justice here keeps coming back up. And there's something unjust about the situation where a male, biological male swimmer can come to the female division with Olympic times, basically beating out women Olympians. That's not right. That's, that's unjust. So you mentioned you are angry and there is something called righteous anger. Wh where do you think that the anger should actually lie. Who who are the people that need to be held responsible? And of uh, we need to fix what situation do we need to fix here? Where should the anger be directed? I guess. Yeah. So I think the primary group is the NCAA. Again, so FINA, the governing body for swimming, came out and put in new policies that said if you don't transition before the age of twelve, you're not allowed to compete in the women's category. So at this time, someone like Leah Thomas, another transgender individual in the sport of swimming, diving, water polo, there might be a few other smaller sports in there. You can't compete on the world championship team. You can't compete in the Olympics. That's a big win. But this says nothing about NCAA. This says nothing about um, college level swimming. So I think the NCAA needs to really re-examine their policy. And I did examine it very deeply during the year to read it. Um, you know, they did not do a lot of scientific research. Policy is really outdated. It was written many, many, many years before there was transgender athletes in the sports. And again, there's no long-term studies on a lot of these things. And I think they need to actually really sit down with proper scientists. And there's plenty of scientists in the field that are willing to consult on this. They're just not willing to hear their opinion. Um, and so, you know, that's something they should work on. And again, I'm not like angry at any individual person. I just think the institution of the NCAA failed us. And again, I can't blame an individual for that. It's a group of people who are responsible and I don't know precisely who all of them are, but that's who we should really look to. And that's who I, I want to make sure they make changes because that's like the group that needs to do this. Yeah. And so we, we, we can attribute definitely the championships. That is an NCAA failure. But if you go beyond that, we start looking at high school athletics. We start looking at middle school athletics. We're talking all over the country, places where, say, biological men are now in locker rooms with women. And, and I think that makes a lot of parents nervous, also in terms of fairness for scholarships. I mean, there's a lot of incentives to, um, there's a lot of reasons as to why we need a more coherent policy at a national level. So what would you say beyond the NCAA, how can we restore integrity and fairness to sports across the country for all women, girls, and boys, really everyone across the country? Yeah. So currently, because the administration that's, you know, holding the presidency is not interested in taking up this issue, 
a lot of these changes need to be made at the state level. So there's uh, the Protect Women, um, Protect Women and Girls Act. There's other Save Women Sports Acts going on that are being passed at state levels. And I think for right now, I would say we need to have policy to policies like that to exist in every single state. So, you know, there's Texas just passed one. Um, Governor Abbott did a great job with that. And so girls and girls and women are going to be protected in the state of Texas. But just because you grew up in California, you're not going to be awarded those same rights. So you got something we need to work on is getting out to these states that are more liberal and finding a way to talk to the policymakers in these liberal states. Because there are a lot of liberal leaning individuals that do believe that this is wrong. So now it's up to us to target those people and make them commit to making these changes that they do actually already believe in. Um, so it's going to be very challenging, but it has to be done in order for women and girls in all 50 states to be protected. Yeah, and I think a big part of that equation is having people like you, having people like Riley come out very publicly uh, in support for advocacy to actually pass legislation, put politicians' feet to the fire to protect women and girls. And one thing that really stuck out to me from my interview with Riley, and, and obviously doing this now in hindsight is even more interesting, she said she received a lot of messages when she first came out, because she came out really when it was truly controversial. She put a lot at stake. A lot of, she was receiving a lot of hate. And she said, at first, it was nice when people would contact me individually, other athletes, and say, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you're doing this. You know, I'm really proud of you. Um, I wish that I could do the same. But she said eventually it actually really frustrated her that people were unwilling to express things they were expressing to her in private and public. And obviously, you know, you've taken up this mantle, which is amazing. You've put a lot at stake. You've received a lot of hate yourself. Um, how can we get more? What advice would you give to someone that's maybe sending those messages in private, but still feel uncomfortable to come out publicly in support of protecting women and girls? Yeah. And um, I think you have to take a risk. But I think the biggest thing for me has been I knew that this was going to be a risk coming out, but just trusting in God and trusting in the world that I'm going to come out okay in the end. So I think some of it is a lot of people fear the unknown, and that's that's totally acceptable to feel that way. But just trusting that if you do the right thing, the right path will follow from that. And I understand all of these people that are, are quiet, and it's a little bit frustrating. And again, some of my teammates have actually reached out to me and said that, you know, I want to be there right there with you, but x y and z thing and i don't i don't blame them for any of that i was i was right there you know six weeks ago um but i think just trusting and it's so hard to do that and it's so much easier said than done but knowing that if you do the right thing the right thing will follow from you for you yeah. that's really that's really beautiful so so you're out now you, you are somewhat figuring out your plans as to now that you've come out publicly and announced what are the next steps to continue the fight for women and girls where do you see your advocacy going in the future what is your future direction here yeah so i'm going to be going to um, washington dc later this week and we're going to do a little bit of uh, some press conferences and talking with some policymakers. Again, this week is the title uh, is the anniversary of title nine um but i think something i want to work on and just getting out to politicians in more liberal areas um and just you know making it clear that this is not anti-trans, this is not anti this thing or the that or the other thing. This is pro-women. And if women don't deserve protection in society, then, you know, like, what is what does that mean of us as a society, right? Like, if we can't acknowledge that women are different and women deserve respect, then that's not a society that anyone really needs to live in. Like, literally, women birth people, right? They have kids. You know, you need women in society to be protective in order to thrive. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So definitely getting out there. In terms of specifics, I'm not entirely sure what's gonna look, what that's going to look like, but I'm working with a bunch of different organizations and just, you know, getting our stories out there, encouraging other women and young girls to, to feel comfortable doing the same. Yeah. And so we, we have a very Catholic audience here. Hopefully we're reaching some new people. I really love so far, you know, what you've had to say as to your Catholic faith intersecting with this, but also using reason and logic. So what would you say to someone who have people in their lives that uh, maybe are a little naive or ignorant, and they just maybe have kind of believed some, some things that they've seen online or whatever, 
and still think, well, you know, we should just be nice to them or whatever. Uh, how do you approach that conversation with charity, but also with truth? Yeah, obviously you want to be nice to people. I don't, I don't, you know, there's a lot of people throwing hate out there and, you know, calling names. Always strive away from doing that, but focus your language on, you know, making change. Like if you're going to approach your politician, just say like, don't name call them and say, oh, you're this thing or that thing for, you know, standing by your policy. Just go in there kindly and just speak your heart. I think that's the biggest thing for me personally. Like I always worry about doing interviews and whatever. But what I what I do when I before I do the interview, I always make sure I think about the young girls and the young women that I'm speaking for. And I think that always just kind of takes me down to a level where I'm not, you know, angry. I'm not going to be just super emotional or super vocal. Just really trying to just levelly explain why I believe what I believe, and. They can always decide to not pass policies based on what you say. But if you speak levelly and calmly um, and just explain your stance, at, at the very least, they'll listen. Whether they do something with that, I don't know. But just getting heard is the first step. Yeah, I've always heard like planting the seeds. You know, you're responsible for what you put forth. But after that, you kind of just leave it up to God in some ways. Uh, so you've obviously gone through a lot of ups and downs, a lot of stress, you know, a lot of sleepless nights, like you said. Um, do you have any uh, patron saints that you were praying to through this, any particular devotions as a Catholic that kind of helped get you through some of those tough times? Mother Mary, of course. Um, my confirmation saint is actually Bridget. Um, so definitely her. I have her, um, my confirmation sponsor got me her little, um, a little icon of her. Um, so definitely hold that with me. Um, and I, I know that there's a lot of other things that are protecting me, obviously, but those have been like the main two. Um, and I'm sure, you know, each Catholic has their own connection to each saint. <laughs> but yeah, definitely. And there has been a lot of protection. I know like Mother Mary is, is here for us women. Um, she is, you know, the, the best woman. Um, and so I know that she has all of us in her heart. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I have my little... That's St. Thomas Aquinas. I don't know if anyone's picked that one up it's a little farther away. But, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so Paula, if we want to help you out, you know, people listening to this, maybe for the first time, if they've been listening for a while, what's the best way to support you and your mission and your work? So right now, um, I don't have any like many organizations, but I've been working with Icons um, and it's just this women's advocacy group. Um, so definitely just checking out some of their stuff. Um, obviously you can like follow me. I uh, again, I might be doing more things on my own in terms can I of, say, can I shameless plug on Twitter? Oh, sure. I, I, I'm a recent follower. Uh, I really, your activity has been great. I saw you've actually interacted with a few Catholic vote things in terms of what we did with the Dodgers. So yes. I'm just going to send everyone on Twitter, go follow her on Twitter. I'll leave her link in the show notes. Um, would love to keep the numbers up there to, yeah, and that's where I do a lot of my, I did, you know, tweet about. The Dodgers did lose 15 0. I'm not sure if you <laughs> saw that. I saw that at like, you know, one in the morning and I sent that a little tweet. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to uh, continue to say nothing happens on accident. Uh, I think that, so that's <laughs> the, the worst thing. home loss. It was 15 to nothing. Worst home loss since the 1800s, late 1800s, oh I think, my. for the Dodgers. So, um, yeah, there's just kind of an example of, uh, like you said, doing the right thing, standing up to blasphemy, even if it's like uncomfortable to some people or whatever. You just, you just, God's good. You know, God continues to reward people for following their conscience, doing the right thing, and really just trying to be faithful in that way. And so that's just been kind of a cool example to, to reach out to a broader audience of like, we see this as wrong. We want to do something about it. And we've just, so many people have joined in. It's been such a cool example. So it's kind of cool that that was able to connect us to in a way that, you know, thank you so much for doing this interview. We were able to kind of connect over that and um, hopefully... This will be the first of many. I'd love to have you back on. Yeah. And if you ever want to contribute to Catholic Foot of the Loop, we, uh, we'd love to keep talking. So, Paula, yeah, thank you love so much for coming on the show. You're an inspiration to many and sharing your story. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's been great. Hopefully, we'll keep in touch and continue to help inform other Catholics who might be lost or confused on this. I think you know, our messaging really just stay true to our faith, but also stay true to the truth. 